Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, and welcome to the Amatech SEI, Understanding Amatech SEI Schematic Drawings webinar. Um, once again, thank you, as always, for joining this webinar. We do understand that your time is precious, so hopefully you'll get something out of this. Um, if you don't mind, if uh, you can type in the chat bar, let me know that you can hear me. That would uh, be the first thing. Um, the volume's okay, and you can see the screen. That would be awesome. Um, obviously, uh, we have a hurricane coming um, on the Gulf Coast, and my heart goes out to everybody in the Beaumont Lake Charles area. So hopefully, fingers crossed, it isn't as bad as what they're saying. Uh, but my prayers are with you. So, um, you know, it's uh, one of those things living in the Gulf, Gulf Coast. Um, uh, that we have to deal with, unfortunately. So hopefully preparations are being made at your plant if you are working in that area, and uh, uh, hopefully your home is all taken care of too. So everybody's saying that you can hear me. That is good. So let's move on uh, to the next slide. Uh, my name is Craig Williams. I'm the Senior Technical Manager for Amatech Solid State Controls. I am based out of the Stafford office here in Houston, Texas. Um, I have 20 years background in the industrial UPS industry. I used to work in the North Sea oil and gas industry in Scotland before I moved over to uh, the United States seven years ago um, to the Gulf Coast area to Houston. Um, I've worked with all major UPS charger manufacturers, um, so I know all the designs very, very well indeed. Um, and uh, I tend to know the good ones and the bad ones, and definitely um, I'm, my unbiased judgment is that SCI is one of the best out there. That's about as salesy as I'm going to get today. <laughs> um, there will also be a lag of around 30 seconds between you hearing my voice and you typing something into the chat bar. Uh, we use Webinar Jam as our webinar platform, and uh, it has to send out this broadcast on iOS, Android, Microsoft, Windows. Um, so there is some processing time that it takes to do that. So it can be about 30 seconds. Webinar Jam has a panic button. So uh, if this webinar freezes or something goes wrong, um, please let me know in the chat bar. And I can press the panic button. And what it does is it, it closes this room automatically opens another room and uh, we can carry on from where we left off. Never had to use it, so fingers crossed that stays the same. Uh, a popular question is, will the webinar be recorded? Yes, um, if you have signed up for the webinar, you will get a link to a webinar jam version of the webinar again. The problem with that one is you can't rewind or fast forward it. You can pause it, but you can't rewind or fast forward it. So after the webinar has finished our marketing department, download that file and then upload it to our Amatech SCI YouTube channel. And then we will send everybody a link to that video. So you can rewind it, fast forward it and pause it. And the plan is that the webinar should last around one hour. Now, this one is pretty heavy with a lot of information. So I'm going to it. I'm going to try and get to it as quickly as I can, um, but uh, I may overrun a little bit. We'll see how it goes. So hopefully today we're going to understand the most common symbols used in an SEI schematic, understand the flow of an Amatech SEI schematic, understand the role semiconductors play in the power conversion, what they do and what we use, understand the power flow through the schematic. So in other words, the first one is understanding the flow from page to page, and then we want to understand the power flow through the schematic as well. We're going to discuss the role that each control board plays. We're not going to go into detail just what role that it plays, and then discuss some of the alarms in the system as well. Okay. Now, um, I will be answering questions. I tend to try and leave them until the end of the, the webinar. But if I see something pop up that's pertinent to what we're looking at, um, I will answer it then. Now, there is going to be absolutely no wordy slides in this presentation. Every slide in this presentation is a drawing from our drawings package. So uh, we're just going to go through it. And uh, hopefully, you're going to learn something, I hope. So. 
We're going to start off with the SE Micro Ferro UPS. Um, this is the workhorse of Amatech SCI with a ferro resonant transformer in it. And this is the first page that you will have in your drawing package. Okay, this is what it will look like. Now, hopefully you're looking at this on a big screen um, because there's going to be a lot of data uh, to display, but I have tried to break it up as much as I possibly can. So in the bottom right hand corner of every drawing, um, you will find this box. So the title here, you can see outline and excuse my drawing. I've just got a new graphics pen and uh, I'm, I'm just getting used to it. So bear with me. Um, so this is an outline drawing uh, for project number 92001024. And that is also the serial number. OK, so that is a serial number for your system. And then we have sheet one of two. So we know in this outline drawing there are two pages, okay? And if you want to know what year your UPS was manufactured, then you can see here that it was 2014 uh, for this system here, okay? So that's in the bottom right-hand corner of every drawing. So on that outline drawing, you can see here, we have the front of the UPS. Okay, you can see here we have the mimic panel, which has the LEDs and um, a block diagram of the UPS. And then we also have the front panel identification on the drawing. And you can see here A1 is the AC output ammeter. Okay, so A1, this meter here is this one here. It is the AC output ammeter. Okay, and then it lists all the other meters that are on the front of the UPS here. Remember, all of our UPSs are custom built. So you may have uh, no um, meters on the front of it, or you may have many more meters um, uh, than the front of this. Okay. And then at the bottom here, we have our circuit breakers. So B1 is the battery input circuit breaker it says circuit breaker here so b1 is this circuit breaker here okay and there is a label above each circuit breaker that will tell you what their use is b301 is this one here that's the ac input breaker okay and here is a block diagram that is uh, part of that drawing package as well and it shows you in a nice consist concise way of how the ups power flow works so you can see here uh, we have the ac input okay uh, the important thing to notice here is the uh, amps max that this system will take 24.4 amps is what this system uh, will take okay so that means that gives you the opportunity to choose your cable sizes correctly you know that the uh, in normal operation the maximum current that this is going to draw is 24.4 amps you can uh, do your cables uh, rate your cable suitably. And we have our input terminals 301, 302, 303 for A phase, B phase, and C phase. We'll go into this when we get into the schematic, but we do not need a neutral for our uh, AC input to the UPS for the rectifier. Then we have B301, that is the AC input breaker that allows us to connect and disconnect the AC power to the 100 amp battery charger that is in this system. Okay. You can see we have 480 going in here and you can see this side of the charger is AC. Okay, 400 volt, 80 volts AC. And then on this side here, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see we have DC. And for a 60 cell system, our most common system, you will have 135 volts DC or 120 volts nominal, which you can see up here, 120 volts nominal. OK. Now that DC splits off at this point here and at this point here to our battery input breaker. Uh, that allows us to connect and disconnect the battery. And then we have our terminals here. 32 is a positive and 31 is a negative. And once again, we tell you 112 amps is the maximum that we expect from the battery. So you can rate your battery cables to the correct size. Obviously, you have to take in cable drop and distance, but um, we're saying 112 amps is the maximum those cables should see in normal operation. OK. And then the DC also goes in to our inverter. Once again, you can see DC on this side. So this side here is DC. 
and then this side here is AC. The inverter turns the DC into AC, okay? And then that AC goes to our static switch. Now, I'm not particularly fond of the way that we draw our static switches. This is actually drawn as a mechanical switch. That's not how the static switch operates, hence the, the term static. There is no moving parts inside a static switch. It's actually semiconductors that perform the switching, but it's just easier for people to understand what's going on. So in normal operation, your inverter will supply load out to your AC output uh, through the static switch with the switch in this position, okay? Now, if the system sees that the inverter fails or there's something wrong at this point here, what happens is the static switch will switch to this position here and will allow the bypass to flow down through here and out through that way there. That is done automatically by the UPS. Um, it's sensed and switched automatically and there will be no break in the supply of load to your AC output circuits. And the last thing I wanna discuss on this drawing here is it tells you about the ground buses. Now there's many different ways you can connect the ground uh, to your system. But in most cases, your bypass input will be supplied by a transformer from your MCC. Usually it's a 480 volt uh, supply into the primary. There's gonna be 120 volts for this system tapped off of the secondary. And this is where you should connect your neutral to ground. Okay, that is always the, the, the most common spot to connect your neutral to ground. So once you have that spot, because it's a, a separately derived source, no other places um, between there and the load circuit should there be another neutral to ground connection because that can allow for um, circulating current. So what you would do in that circumstance, if you have connected the ground correctly to neutral at that transformer, you remove this bus here. That bus should not be connected because you can see here, this is a neutral and then that is the tie that ties the neutral to ground within our system. So you would remove that bus bar, but you can still have that bus bar in place to connect the ground and the panel uh, together. So that's bonding at this point here. You want that in, but you don't want that connection there, okay? Like I said, I'm gonna be going through these really, really quickly. So if you've got any questions, type them in and I'll get to them at the end of this presentation. So now we have page two of um, the outline drawing, okay? And we have custom terminal channels for reference only. So this is customer connection number one, customer connection number one, okay? Now these are bus bars that are physically inside your UPS. And this is where you would connect your MCC 480 volts into our system. So you would have A phase here, B phase here, and C phase here. That is the physical connection point for your external cables to the UPS on a microfarad. Somebody asked, do you get a copy of this training? You can get a video and uh, the webinar. Um, I don't usually send out the slides. I may do it in PDF if, um, if you really want them. Um, so thanks for that question. Then we have our battery input terminals. Once again, these are bus bars. Uh, so you would connect your battery directly on here, positive and negative. And that brings up a really important point please pay great attention to the polarity um, that you connect here. Don't, don't rely on this cable being red and this cable being black from your installation team. Get a voltmeter out and check between that po point there and that point there and make sure that is positive and that is negative. Because if you don't get that right and you close the battery input breaker with reverse polarity, you are going to have a very bad day. Um, it's gonna damage the inside of the UPS and uh, it's not good at all, okay? So make sure you check, double check, triple check the polarity going in there. Here are the ground bars, that are, the bus bars that I told you about. So this is the position that most customers should have their bus bar in, um, connecting the ground and the cabinet together, but you do not connect the neutral to the ground inside the UPS, okay? 
Uh, obviously, that's a case by case basis, but in the majority of systems, that's how it works. Now, you will also notice on the, uh, the right hand side here, we have a neutral bus bar and we have a ground bus bar. Now, remember, they are two separate connections. Do not connect them together and do not assume, do, you know, if you didn't run a ground or a neutral to your system, excuse me, uh, do not use one for the other. Don't interchange them. They are separate bus bars. You only use neutrals, connect neutrals to the neutral bus bar and grounds to the ground bus bars. OK. And the way that we do our system is obviously we have our bypass source AC input. So this is actually the hot of your bypass input for a 120 system. And this is the output hot for our systems. And what you would do is you would connect the bypass neutral to that terminal there, and you would connect the output neutral to that terminal there. Now, if you ran four wires and you ran a ground from the bypass, you would connect the ground bypass uh, cable to that terminal there for ground and the output ground would be run to that terminal there. You have to keep them separate. OK, hopefully that's clear. And also on that page for this second page of the outline was terminal connection number two or terminal channel number two. Um, this shows the alarm connections. We're going to go into this later on in the presentation, but I wanted to show this because it says, OK, 12, number 12 wire is the max wire size for our alarm connections back to your DCS system. OK, and it says reference sheet two of the inverter schematic for the name tag arrangement. And we'll go back to that later on. OK, then also on page two, we have the mimic. This is actually a direct replica of what's on your UPS. OK, um, so you should have this panel. If it's a microfarad system that you've got an SE, then you will have this panel. So it shows our AC input breaker here. We have got our float push button here, S301. We have our equalized push button, S302. So if float is on, this green LED will be on. And if equalized is on, this amber LED will be on. OK, so we've got AC going in here and we've got DC coming out here. The DC goes to our battery. Now down at the battery, we have a red LED to say battery supplying load. So we get an alarm if the battery is supplying load. And also we have this LED here to tell you if this battery input breaker is open. Now, I don't know why we make this green, kind of strange to me. This should be an amber. That should be amber if you ask me, but it is what it is. So if the battery breaker is open, you will get an LED to tell you that. OK, then our DC goes into the inverter. The only we don't have an inverter on or off button on our micro ferro SE systems. All we have is this green in sync alarm, which tells you that the bypass supply is synchronized with the output of the inverter. That should be on uh, in normal operation. OK, and then we also have on our static switch on the front, we have our inverter to load push button, and that would give you a green LED because that's our normal operation. And S202 is our manual bypass to load push button. We can change the static switch position using these uh, buttons here. OK. And then obviously we have our output to the system this way here. And the last thing is our alarms. Here, this system only has three alarms, but in many circumstances, you're going to have a row of five here. And you could have another five here. All of our systems are custom made and you can have as many alarms as you want. So um, you could have more than what's displayed here. And then this key shows you what the color of the LED should be. OK. So here's the next section of the drawing package that you will get. This is now the schematics. And for this one here, it is for the 100 amp battery charger. OK, and it says page one of one. So that means for the battery charger, there is only one drawing. OK, I wanted to highlight this box down in the bottom left 
corner here. You can't see it very well, so I've blown it up for you on the next page. What it does is it shows you um, the wire sizes for all of the cables inside our UPS. So we use an alphabetical um, allocation system. So if the wire has an A suffix, then it's a number 18 cable. Uh, if it has L, it will be a one or cable. And it tells you everything, uh, all the other cable sizes there. If the cable is isolated, then it has that symbol. If it is isolated twisted pair, you have that symbol. This symbol means a tie point, and that means a twisted pair. And then if any of the PCBs have this symbol on it, that shows a indicator on the PCB. So I'm going to go to uh, this drawing here. So you can see that this says 354E. OK, so if we go back, E is number 10. So we know that this cable here is number 10 cable. OK, if it said 354EE, then it would be two number 10s in parallel. OK, all of our cables have that. And actually, one thing I didn't mention is, is it on this page here? Any unmarked wires are always going to be number 22. OK, so if it doesn't have a letter after the cable number, then it is number 22. So we know that this cable here is a number 22 cable because there's no letter after it. So now we get into the nuts and bolts of things. This is actually the schematic for our charger in a micro ferro UPS system. And this is basically uh, how our charger operates. So we have, this is your 480 volts from your MCC coming in on the left-hand cor bottom corner here. A phase, B phase, C phase. Once again, look, we do not run a neutral. We don't need a neutral. You can't run a neutral because we don't have a neutral connection point inside our system. You can, there is going to be a ground terminal connection point, so you can run a ground, but we do not run a neutral because we have a delta transformer on the input to our system, and it does not require a neutral. So we have our AC input breaker right here. So if you close that, you get 480 volts going to the primary of this transformer. Now look, you can see here there is no connection between the primary transformer and the secondary. It is completely galvanically isolated, okay? No electrical connection between the primary and the secondary of our input transformer on the charger. Uh, this here just shows you there's an auxiliary transformer, um, and that tells us it's going to the inverter schematic, and we'll get to see that in a little while, okay? So, delta primary, Y or star, whichever way you like to call it, on the secondary, okay? And the secondary, we also step down the voltage for our 120 volt systems. This voltage here is going to be around about 130 volts AC, okay? 130 volts and between phase to phase. So phase to phase, 130 volts AC. And you can notice that we do not have um, the star point here, uh, or the Y point is not connected to uh, a neutral point or ground inside the uh, charger either, okay? And then that 130 volts goes into our fuses. Now, one thing that does seem to confuse people, and I want to get out of the way straight away, fuses only protect things that are upstream of the fuse itself. So, for example, let's say this phase here to this phase here. Let's say it has a direct short for some reason, okay? None of these fuses are gonna blow because of a fault that is prior to where the fuse is. If you have this fault here, this battery, this input breaker here will more likely trip, okay? These fuses are not gonna blow. These fuses are here to protect these devices here, which are our SCRs inside our charger. So if we have a fault on one of those, yes, one of these fuses will blow. But nothing prior to the fuses will blow, okay? And that leads us 
to our SCRs. So an SCR symbol is drawn like that. This is the cathode, this is the anode, and this is our gate. Okay, and we have six of them. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we label them. Any semiconductors in our system is labeled with a Q. So Q301 through Q306 is our SCRs in our rectifier bridge. And that brings us to our control board. Okay, we have to tell the SCRs when to come on. So we send our gate signals to each individual SCR from the control board on these terminals here. So for the top SCRs, we've drawn the actual physical connections. But on the bottom SCRs, we just reference the terminal point because obviously it'd be very messy if we drew 23 down to there and 24 down to there. The drawing would get illegible. So um, we're saying here, this terminal 23 goes to this terminal 23 here. This terminal 27 goes to this terminal here. Okay. So that's our gate signals going to the SCRs. We have a power LED on the X302 charger control board within the uh, UPS as well. And it gets its power from auxiliary transformers on the secondary here, okay? And phase to phase, this is around about 48 volts AC that this board uh, gets. So between this terminal here and this terminal here, it's gonna be about 48 volts. And that's for two purposes. It is for a power. The, it rec this control board rectifies that, that voltage and turns it uh, into DC. Uh, for all the controls. And it also is the synchronizing signal for these SCRs. Now, don't get confused with sync for the bypass and the inverter. That's not what it is. Basically, the charging control board needs to know where about in the sine wave it is before it turns this SCR on so it can rectify the, the voltage correctly. So these terminals here is where it gets that information from. Okay. And there's two other inputs to the charger control board. Um, we have 10 and 9 here. This is our reference voltage. This is uh, for our float equalized circuit. Basically, on pin 9, we send 10 volts out of this charger control board. Okay. Now, if you are in float operation, K306 will be de energized and that will be on. OK, so if you follow this 10 volts through, it goes down through this contact here and then into this potentiometer. And this is float R301. This is a potentiometer that adjusts the float voltage level. And that goes back into the control board on pin 10. And obviously that voltage can be anywhere between 0 and 10 volts approximately. So that gives us our reference for the control board. Uh, either for float operation or for equalize operation. So obviously, if we press the equalize button, the uh, relay energizes, this opens and K306 closes the other contact. So 10 volts will then go out this way through and then through the equalize uh, potentiometer. So therefore, we can have two separate references going into pin 10 um, uh, to adjust the voltage for float or for equalize. And the final input to the uh, charger control board is the feedback, um, the feedback signal. This control board here, it needs to know what the output of the system here, remember, it should be 135 volts coming out of the system there, DC, okay? So on the positive side, that goes up there into that terminal. And then on the negative side, it comes down through, goes through this contact. I'll explain that in just a moment. Oop, I told you my drawing was terrible. So between these two points here, we should have 135 volts DC. That's monitoring the output of the system. And it's a, a closed loop feedback uh, signal. So as if the voltage went down, the charger would see that and it would advance the uh, signals to the SCRs to say, okay, I need to increase that voltage. 
So it would send the gate signals earlier in the, the sine wave and cause the output voltage to go back up again, and obviously vice versa as well. And uh, I said I was going to tell you about K304, and sorry if I'm going fast, but I've got a lot to get through. K304 is a voltage detection relay. It's monitoring if we actually have AC input going into the system. Okay, so if we have voltage here, this relay is energized. Okay, and therefore this contact will be closed, which allows the feedback to get to the board. And the reason we have that circuit is if we have a power failure, this relay here will de-energize. This contact here will stay in its open state and we can't get up to this point here. So what that contact really does, it prevents anything, any capacitors on the board here, discharging the batteries, because obviously you have your battery connected out here, slowly discharging the battery if we have a power failure. So that is what that contact uh, for K304 is, okay? Cool. Okay, the next one is uh, the system schematic for the inverter. So it's in the same drawing package, um, and now we have sheet one of two for the same serial number, but now we're talking about the inverter, okay? So here's a bigger version of that drawing. The first thing to notice is we still draw the rectifier um, on this system. So if you went back to the drawings, this is actually from your MCC. This is your three phase 480 going into the rectifier. And here's our DC coming out of the rectifier circuit. OK, we draw it as a block on the inverter, just so you know where this DC is coming from. OK, so at this point here, we should have 135 volts from your charger. And then if we go out this way, that takes us to your battery input breaker. And if you close that, that connects your, whoop, your battery there, okay? One symbol that I didn't mention on the previous page was this symbol here. L is for inductor. So this is an inductor, a choke or a reactor, whatever you want to call it. It's there for filtering. Um, that's what its purpose is, okay? So we have our DC going into this point here. C1 is our electrolytic capacitors, okay? So that is a bank of big electrolytic power capacitors inside our system, uh, once again, for uh, filtering and for inductive kickbacks from the IGBTs and things like that. Very important to have these capacitors um, in good uh, operation. And then that 135 volts goes to F2 as a fuse. Now, remember, once again, if we have a fault back here between positive and negative, this fuse is not going to blow. This fuse only protects anything this on this side of the fuse. So this fuse's um, purpose is if one of these sem uh, semiconductors here fails, then that fuse will blow and hopefully protect the other one from blowing. Um, it is a semiconductor fuse, but this is an IGBT, and fuses are not quick enough usually to protect IGBTs. So um, it's there for to protect the system after the IGBT has failed catastrophically. Okay. So the IGBT, we have one here and we have one here. They're connected to a snubber board. The snubber board is there to protect the IGBT from uh, high transients, uh, spikes, inductive kickbacks. Um, it's got capacitors and diodes uh, on this board here to try and protect the IGBT as much as possible. And that's where we get our gate, our drive signals, our gate drive signals. That one uh, goes to there and that one goes to there. So we have a snubber board for this IGBT and the snubber board for this IGBT. And then that's connected to our X2 static switch control board. Okay. So as I, I said earlier, we don't have an on-off switch for the microferro UPS. 
Okay, so you may think to yourself, well, how do we switch the inverter on? Well, it's actually quite simple. We have this circuit here. We have B1 aux. B1 is an auxiliary contact connected to the battery input breaker. Okay, so when the battery input breaker is open, B1 aux is open. And when we close the battery input breaker, B1 aux close, closes, sorry. So this terminal here is looking for a close. When somebody closes the battery input breaker, it sends a signal to the inverter control board and tells it to start sending gate drive signals to the IGBTs to turn the DC into AC. So that's how you turn the inverter on in one of our systems, okay? Uh, this circuit here, this is our under voltage circuit. So if I, obviously if we lose power and the charger turns off, then our battery starts to supply load. And when batteries supply load, they start discharging. Now we have to protect the battery from discharging below 105 volts DC for a 60 cell system, because that could damage the battery irreparably, irreparably. So we want to protect that. So we have a sensing circuit um, on the board, it actually monitors the DC at this point here. And when that gets down <clears throat> to 105 volts or lower, it energizes uh, K4. K4 closes and basically allows power to B1 shunt trip coil. This is the trip coil for B1. And therefore, we can uh, open this breaker here and protect the battery. So that is what that circuit is is for. So now what I'll do quickly, um, we've got another presentation that shows you how our inverters work, but I'll quickly show you what's going on here. So this is the positive. So let's say we have Q1 turned on. So Q1, if we follow this down here, this goes into the center tap of this transformer. And that will allow us to go down this way here because we always have to get return back to negative, okay? that will give us a positive pulse going into that transformer, okay? So we've got a positive pulse. Now let's turn off Q1, let's turn on Q2. Once again, it's a positive, it's going through, down this way, down to the center tap here, but now we go down this way, okay? And that gives us and we do that at 60 hertz here in the US, okay? So just by switching the IGBTs on and off at 60 hertz, we get on the primary of transformer TA01, we get a square wave. And the magnitude of the square wave is whatever the DC voltage is. So it should be 135 volts DC. 135 volts DC. So peak to peak, it's going to be 270. Okay. That is for a 60 cell battery system. Okay. We do not adjust the peaks, the voltage of the uh, square wave. That is done. All the regulation is done by TA01. It is a ferro resonant transformer or another word for it is a CVT, a constant voltage transformer. Basically within a certain parameters, whatever voltage you put in on the primary doesn't affect the secondary. The secondary will stay steady. So we designed the transformer to have a steady 120 volts AC out, okay? I'm not gonna go into how that happens. Uh, it's to do with this tank circuit and uh, all of these separate windings, compensating windings and, and things like that. Um, but for a varying input, we have a steady output, okay? So once again, square wave in on the primary, but on the secondary, we get a beautiful sine wave. Because of these capacitors and all the inductance, it filters the square wave into a sine wave, okay? And we have a frequent, uh, sorry, a, uh, yeah, it's a frequency meter for the inverter. We have a voltmeter for the inverter. And then we also have M1 as a fan. Um, it's a fan to keep the inverter cool, okay? And the fan has a tachometer on it. So you can see here that that is the taco for the, uh, uh, not taco for reading, <laughs> the tachometer for the fan. And if this 
control board here senses the uh, tachometer and if it sees it's going too slow, it gives us an alarm, okay? Now our 120 volts then goes into this fuse here. Remember, this fuse is not protecting us back here. If we have a direct short between that point there and that point there, this fuse will not blow, okay? The control circuit within the uh, inverter bridge and the inverter controller will uh, prevent us from feeding into that fault. It will turn off the uh, inverter. This fuse here is to protect these semiconductor devices in the uh, static switch, okay? So here's our inverter voltage here, 120 volts, and it goes into our static switch. Remember I said this is not, does not have any moving parts. This is the inverter static switch. And this is the bypass static switch. Okay. Now in normal operation, this SCR and this SCR will be turned on, which will allow our AC to go this way here and will allow our AC to go out to the load. Okay. Now, if the static switch, if this control board here notices something has gone wrong with the inverter, then it says, okay, we have a problem. We have either no power or low, low voltage going into the static switch here, which is not good for your load circuits. So what it does is it says, okay, I'm going to turn on this SCR and this SCR. And this is the bypass supply that comes in through here. And basically what it does is it allows the bypass to feed the load circuits instead. And it's an instantaneous transfer. That's why they have to be synchronized together. This SCR turns on, the static switch turns on, and that static switch turns off. And it's all done automatically by this control board here. There's no manual interaction uh, whatsoever, okay? So that's the static switch. And obviously the gate drives uh, come from the uh, control board here into a static switch interface board. I'm not gonna go into uh, how that operates. On the bypass supply, we have our 120 volts AC input, AC coming in from your MCC. It's synchronized to the inverter. We have our bypass source AC input breaker here. The other thing we have is a contactor here. This is our UL contactor. Uh, UL makes us have a back feed contactor in, or a back feed circuit in all of our UPSs. And all that contactor is there for is, you can see here K1 is the coil for this contactor. So it's connected directly across that 120 volts. So if uh, we have 120 volts present, this contactor here will energize and close and will allow the bypass to go through that way there. But let's say you're doing work out here. Let's say you're working on the MCC that feeds that terminal, but you need your inverter to still be running. Well, we can't guarantee for absolutely sure that this static switch doesn't have a problem when you're working on there. So if we've isolated this, you're going to have zero volts here. So that relay, that coil is going to be off. So this contactor here is going to be off. So if we did have a failure in this static switch here, we could, in theory, the inverter could feed back through there and through to this point here. But this backfeed contactor doesn't allow us to backfeed here uh, onto a, a dead bus and maybe uh, electrocute somebody. So that's why UL um, want us to have that. Okay. Um, we have another fan here. We have T202 is a, a CT that's connected to the uh, output of the system that monitors the output current and it has uh, it goes back to the inverter control board here. You can say, see here, it says to X2J5 and X2J5 is here from TO2. So that's where the current sensing goes back in and basically the UPS will perform some actions depending on how much current is flowing. And then we have our output output ammeter there. And then we go out to our load terminals there. Okay. Phew. I'm going to take a drink again. Hope your brains aren't hurting. 
because mine is, and I'm, and I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so uh, the next page is sheet two of two for the uh, inverter schematic. Okay. Um, I just got a question there. Is it drawn for 40 kVA? His drawing does not have a K1 relay, um, as I stated. Um, I will have to get back to you on that. Um, it depends if you have a DPP or if you have a microfarad. We have different design feedback UL circuits for different UPSs. Uh, if you want to privately post me your serial number, I can have a look at that later. Okay, so this is page two of two, and it just shows you the control boards, okay? So our control boards need power. So we get our power from bypass, from the DC, and from the input to the rectifier, okay? That's our three sources of power, and that power turns the DC, turns into DC for uh, this control board here, okay? So all these lights should be on to tell you that you're good, okay? We also have some other LEDs uh, on here. There's a fault, so that's red, that shouldn't be on. There's a, uh, an okay communication alarm, it should be flashing um, and stuff like that. Most of the other connections are communication uh, connections to this control board, because it speaks to the alarm board, it speaks to the relay interface board. Um, so this is how uh, our three other boards connect uh, to the system. And you can see at the top here, this is where our push buttons interact with the system. So our float equalized push buttons are up there. If you press float button, it sends a signal to the indicator alarm board, which then sends that signal to the display alarm controller to know that you've done uh, press float. And the same for inverter to load. If you press inverter to load, it sends a signal to this board here, which then tells the inverter static switch board to uh, transfer the static switch to inverter. And then down here, we have the relay interface board. Now, uh, once I get into the DPP system, uh, I'll go into a little bit more depth about how you connect these alarms. So please bear with me. So that's the, the UPS as a whole. So now for the, the, the serial number that we're discussing so far, this serial number here, they ordered a separate remote manual bypass switch. So this is the drawing for that. You can see sheet one of one. This is the outline for the remote manual bypass switch. Obviously, it's very difficult to see what's going on, so I blew it up for you. So this is what the front of the, the RMBS looks like, okay? And this is a block diagram. This is a very simple way uh, for you to look at it. Now, you have to remember that our, our RMBS is sold as separate parts of the system um, um, unless it was ordered as part of the overall system and you asked for an overall drawing. So in this system here, this, the RMBS is separate from the outline drawing for the UPS. And uh, so you have to use your brain a little bit to figure out what's going on, but I'll make it easy for you. So here we have a transformer. Now this is from your MCC. Now this is usually 480 volts um, from your MCC and it goes to a 120 volt step down transformer. Okay, so this is your bypass for the, uh, for the system, but it has to go through our RMBS first, okay? So um, once again, I told you that should be connected to ground, not at the RMBS, although you could do it there, but it's external to the system, okay? So that is where our bypass source comes in. And then on this side here, this is where the bypass to the UPS, okay? So basically that goes into the uh, the bypass static switch inside the UPS, okay? And then we have our uh, inverter static switch comes out here. So this is the output from the UPS, okay? And then this 
is our load circuits all your load circuits that will probably go to a distribution an ac distribution panel somewhere in your plant and feed the loads okay and the way that we do these connections is uh, we have a neutral bus bar inside the rmbs so the neutral for the ac output would connect to this bus bar the neutral for the output of the ups would connect to this bus bar the neutral for the bypass input to the rmbs would connect to the bus bar and the neutral for the bypass to the ups would connect to the bus bar okay so all four neutrals would be connected on that bus bar and then the hots are connected below so you can see here it says bypass source ac input 800 that goes all the way to there okay 199 that goes there that is the normal source ac input bypass applied to the ups hot gets connected there and the output of the system 810 gets connected there okay And then this is the LED panel on the front of your RMBS. All the lights should be green. So that's saying that the normal source to load is on. The normal source is available. The bypass source is available and you should be in sync. And we have a lamp test button there as well. Okay. Powering on. Okay, so this next page is the schematic for the RMBS. And once again, there is one sheet. Uh, sheet one of one okay and i'm going to blow this up on the next page for you so once again bypass from mcc so that's from your plan mcc okay this is two ups bypass input okay so that's the bypass applied to the ups this is the output from the UPS. Okay, and then this is your load circuits. Okay, here is your handle on front of the UPS. Okay, um, so if you're in position one, that's normal operation. That's the handle pointing this way here. If the handle was pointing that way there, it would be at position two. And if the handle was pointing this way there, it would be at position three. Okay. Let me clear all of that. So the output of our system, of our UPS in normal operation is coming along here. This is the hot here. In position one, the normal operation, this is closed. So power can flow this way to load, okay? Everything's good. But also we need to have a bypass available. So you can see here that this has a one here. So in position one, that is also closed and that allows the hot to go through and supply the bypass to UPS. Okay, so a normal operation bypass is supplying that way there to the UPS and the UPS is actually feeding the load through the inverter that way there. This does not have a one, so this is open. Okay, there's no connection there. Now, if we move to position two on S800, okay, this switch here has a two so that will close this switch here has a two that will remain closed this switch here does not have a two so that will open and i'll show you what happens here okay so it's a make before break switch so this makes which allows your bypass to supply directly to the load this way here before this opens so at one period of time this will be closed and this will be closed at the same time the make before breaking 
okay and then it breaks so the ups is not feeding past this point here anymore that means we are in bypass to load through the rmbs so this is a physical connection now no matter what the ups does it is not making it through this switch you are connected directly to grid power through your mcc to your load circuits okay and then the only difference with position three um, position three that will be closed look we have a number three there that will be open because it does not have a position three and this will be open it does not have a position three so power is going in down and out that way there is no power going out here and if you went in and you locked out and tagged out every um the ac input the battery input and the output from the ups you have no power going in there you know you have your ups out here connected there and connected there with the uh, ups with the rmbs sorry in isolated bypass position you can actually take this ups remove it completely install a new ups and still keep your load circuits powered up without any issues whatsoever so uh, it also allows maintenance to be performed on the, the, the ups itself really really easily as well okay So that's everything for the uh, microfarad UPS. I'm going to move quickly on to the DPP, and I'm at 56 minutes, so I'm going to have to fly through this. So here is our microprocessor-controlled uh, DPP pulse width modulated UPS. Okay, this is the first uh, outline drawing in the package. You can see here that is sheet one of one outline. And this is a system that was bought as a complete package from Amatech Solid State Controls. So we have our UPS here. We also supplied an RMBS. Uh, we know uh, we probably supplied this bypass transformer for the customer as well. And they asked for two disconnect switches because they wanted to have two parallel battery banks. That was like ground, sorry. That's a battery. Okay. So we can see in this one drawing, the whole system as a, uh, as a whole. Uh, I like this drawing. It, it gives you a good idea of what's going uh, on. Okay. So the next page is um, uh, the outline drawing for the UPS itself. We can see here it's sheet one of four. Once again, this is the front of the UPS and we have our front panel identification CB1 is this breaker here. It's an AC input breaker, okay? Switch two, you can't see it very well. Um, switch two is here, and that's the inverter enable on off switch, okay? So it gives you a good idea of what's going on the front of the system. Page two of that uh, diagram we have a block diagram we have the alarm connections and we have the startup procedure and we'll see that on the next page okay so here's our block diagram identical pretty much to the uh, SE system that I just discussed but you can see here we have our alarm connections and you can read this um, much better than the, the previous one for the, the SE. Oops, sorry, uh, pressed the wrong button. So here's our common alarm. And we have the common terminal, the normally open and the normally closed. So we get so much confusion about how you connect this back to your DCS system, okay? Now for a DCS system, you should always have a fail safe mode of operation so that means the signal that goes to your dcs should be an open for alarm okay and the reason that we have an open for alarm is if the cable becomes disconnected between the ups and the dcs or somebody cuts that cable you're going to get an alarm at your dcs system to tell you something's wrong okay so the question that everybody has is um which terminals do we connect our DCS to? 
Well, we try to make it easy. We say under normal operation, the relay is energized. So when we're healthy, the relay is energized. So the way to look at it is, okay, when it's not healthy, it's de-energized. De-energized. Okay, not healthy. So that's the state that we want an open to your DCS system. So these terminals are drawn, uh, this terminal here and this terminal here, they're drawn in the off-the-shelf de-energized state. So you would connect your DCS to the common and the normally open, because when that energizes, it closes. And a closed alarm will not give you an alarm at your DCS system. Hopefully that um, clears that. And remember, each relay is different. This is energized in normal operation. The bypass to load one is de-energized in normal operation. So you would have to connect to the common and normally closed alarm terminals for to get a fail-safe alarm for the bypass to load. We also have our Modbus and our Ethernet connection uh, points in there. Um, and that's all there really is on that one. Here's the startup placard, uh, startup procedure and shutdown procedure. Um, please bear in mind, this is tested at the factory. So you can't go wrong if you go and follow this procedure. When you're working on a UPS, don't assume that you did it one way for one UPS and that will work for every other UPS. The procedure is there for a reason. Please always follow the startup procedure and shutdown procedure and then you will be good. Okay. And uh, this is the terminal connections. We show you the display panel, but this is where your external connections come into the DPP UPS. And I'll blow that up and let you see that in just a second. So for our battery input, these are actually stabs connected directly on the back of the circuit breaker. And this is where you connect your cable. So that is your negative, and that is your positive. That's where you connect your cables directly from your battery onto those terminals there, okay? For your AC input breaker, we have stabs on CB1, on the back of the breaker itself. You connect A phase there, B phase there, and C phase there. For the output, the hot AC output connects to 199, okay? The neutral connects to 15, and the ground connects to 115, okay? And for the bypass input, CB3, this is a circuit breaker, and you connect to the stabs. Actually, there's no stab there. Uh, you just connect to 110. We only connect the hot. The neutral goes to that bus bar, remember. And then we have our screen. So this is a touch screen here. We've got our alarms. Remember, there can be more um, depending on which UPS you bought. Here is the inverter on off switch. Um, here is how our engineers connect with the field service engineers connect with the system to get all the data from the system through this USB. It used to be an RS-232 connection. It's now USB. And then these are the keypad push buttons. Um, you can see this one here, follow it down. And that's our float um, push button. And there's a green light there that would tell you that you're in float. And this page here shows you all of the alarms that comes with your UPS. Remember, our UPS is a custom built, so the alarms will be different for every system. So this is a list of all the alarms. Charger fan failure, charger failure. These are different for every UPS we sell. So that's why we list it for you. We tell you um, which alarms uh, you purchased. And then now we have the schematic uh for the dpp ups and it's actually very very similar to the microferro we've got a delta transformer there connected to a y or star transformer there we've got our six scrs exactly the same the only difference with the charger rectifier board here is uh, we have a gate drive board connected to it and we also uh use fiber optic cable now to communicate with the 
uh, other parts of the system with this screen on the front of the system. So this is now micro processor based uh, when the SE charger was mostly an analog charger. Okay. And that just shows you it in more detail. Um, our SCRs are connected to heat sinks and we have a thermostat connected to the heat sink. If it gets too hot, it switches the gate signals to the charger off. Um, also, this system here has fuse monitoring. So if any of these fuses here blow, then this contact here will open and we will get an alarm. Actually, it could be the other way around if they are connected in series. Uh, yeah, actually, it's the other way around. If we get it closed, it will give us an alarm. We're monitoring the current here. The good thing about the DPP system is we have a battery current and a DC current. So this shunt here measures the overall current to the system, and this shunt here only monitors the battery because this is the output to the system. Okay. So we can actually have a two-stage current limit for our battery charger. We can say, okay, this is a 100 amp charger, but we're only gonna allow 10 amps to go to our battery, but we'll allow 100 amps to go to the load itself. We can have two separate current limits because a lot of the battery manufacturers are saying you want to limit the current to a certain amount um, these days. This is the inverter bridge for our DPP system. Once again, if you're still with us, I appreciate it. I know I'm running late and I knew I would talk too much. I always do, um, but I'm trying to give you as much information as possible. So once again, in our inverter, we use IGBTs. Okay, uh, that's an IGBT, IGBT. I, IGBT is an insulated gate bipolar transistor. Another one there and another one there, okay? And this is in an H bridge configuration. So um, you can see that the power comes along here. What we have to do is we have to switch this IGBT on and this IGBT on and stay with me. That will allow us to go down, excuse my drawing, down here through the transformer, back, oop, uh, back up here, and my drawings cut off and basically it gets us back oh there it is there excuse me down here through that igbt and back and that will give us a negative uh on the output there sorry for my poor drawing and then we switch q3 and q2 on and once again the positive comes down let me do that again this one here, this one here, power comes down through there. And then this side is now more positive than this side. We go down there, up, down through there, and that gives us a positive cycle. So we switch in pairs, this one and this one come on, and then this one and this one come on. And we don't do that at 60 hertz. We actually do that at eight kilohertz in our DPP system. And we use pulse width modulation. Basically, we create a pulse train like that. And then uh, it does that. But it's at 8,000 hertz. So it's not a square wave we put out. It's a pulse width modulated output. And that allows the sine wave on the secondary of the transformer to be uh, much better. And we have more control over this because the control board, uh, the inverter stacks, which control board, can change the pulse width at any point. So we have much more control on the output of our inverter there. I'm gonna to have to push on guys. I'm not gonna go over all of this. We do have a presentation on how the inverter uh, works. So I just wanted to walk through the drawing so you have a better idea. And then here's our static switch um, for uh, the system. Let me see. Yeah, I did blow it up. So this is the inverter output. So this is the inverter static switch. And this is the bypass. Okay, so normal operation, the inverter, this static switch is on. We go down there and out to the load. Okay. 
and if something in there fails this static switch comes on and the bypass feeds the load okay and here's all of the other uh, control boards and relay boards that are inside uh, the system oops and that's it blown up you can see there's lots of external contacts these are actually auxiliary contacts connected so uh, cb1 is for the ac input so that tells us that the ac input breaker is open this one here is the bypass input breaker uh, this is the inverter output this system has an inverter output breaker on it as well so it can tell us what the contacts um what the state of each breaker is and we've got one more page okay once again it tells you under normal operation relay is energized, de-energized, and energized. That goes back to the DCS, DCS connections. And then the last one is the power supplies and the fan failure boards, okay? So in this system here, we had um, four fans for the inverter and the static switch. So what we do is we connect them to a fan failure board. And those fans, this is a tachometer. We send a five volt signal to the fan and then we get a signal back that is a square wave representation of how fast that fan's going. And if that slows down too much, we're monitoring the frequency, then we get an alarm. And that's the same here. Uh, we send five volts out and the signal comes back. So that's how we monitor the fans. If they, are, you know, a lot of people give us a call and say, we've got a fan fail alarm, but the fan is still spinning. Well, it's maybe because the bearings are starting to seize up. It's still spinning, but it's spinning slower than it should be. So therefore, it's a predictor that the fan is going to fail soon. So take those alarms um, seriously because it is showing you that the alarm, the fan, sorry, is going to fail. And the last one is a power supply. OK. Once again, our power supply inside our UPS, we take the DC, um, uh, so that's usually 135 volts DC. And then we take an AC input. This is from the rectifier. OK, we take 120 volts AC. And then we actually take 120 volts AC from the bypass. So we have three power modes of power that go into this power supply. So we can lose the bypass. We can lose the AC input, and as long as we have battery, all of the power supplies on this board will still be okay. So that's just to show you that we have three power supplies. Uh, so you should never have uh, an issue where the power supplies all fail because uh, if you lose all three, if you lose battery, AC input, and bypass supply, then you're dead in the water anyway, okay? And then all of these connections here is the power supplies, the 24 volts getting sent out to uh, all the places in the UPS that require that power. Okay, I think that is about it. Ooh, any questions? I am so sorry that I had to go so fast. Um, uh, obviously, we can't do in-person classes at this moment in time so hopefully <coughs> excuse me hopefully when covid goes away um, and you're really interested in a more in-depth view of how our ups's work you can book a class at our stafford facility it's fantastic um you get hands-on experience um it really everybody that comes to our in-person classes goes away learning so much and it's really hard to do on a webinar so um what i'm going to do now is um send it out to anybody if there's any questions so i'm going to put my pen down let's have a look do i have a procedure of connecting a laptop to a ferro ups using the rs232 plugin i have the program downloaded but i've not been able to successfully connect that's probably because you're not using a null modem cable for our ferro ups's you have to use a null modem cable that switches the pins on the rs232 plug um, so give that a try uh, so it's a very common question we get asked it's not a straight through rs232 cable that we use on the ferro machines it has to be a null modem cable 
Does the Faro UPS have any programming for automatic equalized charging? No. It, it, unless your system was um, had that option designed in. Basically, we can have a, a relay that monitors the AC input to your UPS. And if the power goes off for more than five minutes, when the power comes back on again, the system will go into equalize for whatever time you have set. But it is a it's not a programming thing. It's a physical relay with a timer that has to be installed. So it's difficult to retrofit. So good question, though. Um, somebody said that I messed up my wire numbers when I was talking about the ground. Wire 800 should not have been connected to ground. You're absolutely correct. Um, uh, that should have been, I can't even remember which slide that was. Let's have a look. Do, 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 do. I'll go through it. Unfortunately, this presentation doesn't let me choose slides. I've got to go through previous, previous, previous. So just give me a moment. I will get there. It was on the bypass switch, so we should be just coming up to it very soon. Uh, if you've got any more questions, just type them in. I will get to them. It should be coming up now. Here we go. Yeah. Wire 800 is this wire here, so it should, it is the hot, okay? Because all of our neutrals are labeled 15. So that is a neutral, that is a neutral, that is a neutral, and that is a neutral. So your hots are 800, 810, 199, and 110. So I apologize if I misspoke. It's because I'm trying to get through it so fast. <laughs> uh let's have a look some more people asking for a copy of this training the problem is if i send you just the pdf slides it's not going to give you any information because there's no writing to indicate what it was go to the youtube channel um, and that will be a very good reference for you um if the inverter should fail catastrophically will the static switch continue to pass power from bypass to load absolutely it will um our inverter can actually blow up, go on fire, self-implode, whatever you want. Um, the static switch will uh, transfer to bypass and it will feed uh, the load without any interruptions whatsoever. Obviously, unless the static switch caught, catches on fire because the inverter is on fire. Um, but that is never going to happen. Um, uh, so... Uh, Absolutely. The answer to that question, Jeff, is if the fa inverter fails catastrophically, the static switch will transfer to bypass. And our bypass, um, a lot of UPS manufacturers don't size their static switches to um, take an overload situation. Our, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure our static switches do 200% load for a considerable amount of time. They are overrated specifically for that issue. Let's see what else. Um, when should we choose Ferro versus DPP? Very good question. Um, it all depends on preference. Um, the DPP has a smaller footprint. So if size is an issue, uh, we would always recommend that you go for the DPP. Um, the DPP and the Ferro, they're both very, very reliable systems. Um, it can be a personal preference. The, the noise levels for a Ferro are higher. Um, it does make more audible noise, um, but the frequency of the noise from a DPP is higher, so it can be slightly more annoying to some people. So it, that's a personal choice. The regulation out of the DPP is far better than the Ferro. Um, so because it's digitally controlled. So if uh, harmonics going to your load circuits are a huge concern, maybe go for a DPP over a Ferro. But, you know, we have so many UPSs in the North American market, both Ferro and DPP out there, and they are both very, very reliable. Okay. Let's have a look. 
<laughs> it was it would be nice if i could show pictures of the control boards you're absolutely correct michael but then i'd be on for another two days <laughs> i'm only joking but i can only fit so much into what's supposed to be a one hour presentation maybe what i'll do is for the next presentation i'll go over each of the control boards and i'll put pictures on each slide and show you what they look like and uh uh, and maybe I could even take a video of some of the boards, insert that into the presentation and show you what they should look like in normal operation. See, good ideas like that really help out for my next uh, webinar presentation. So I like that, Michael. I think I will do that for one of my next webinars and show you all of the PCBs. But it would have been too much information for this, for this one here. Um, okay, so... That's an hour and 20. Uh, the fact that there's still 50 people on listening to me after all this time is very, very appreciated. Um, I We do uh, care about our customers and we try and give you as much information as possible. I hope you find these webinars very helpful. Don't forget you will receive a link. Um, Brooke has put it in the chat bar there where the webinars are posted. So if you want to either click on that link or copy and paste it and then favorite it in your uh, bookmarks, then you'll always be able to uh, find it. Um, and you will also receive an email with that uh, link in it as well. So if we don't have any more questions, once again, thank you. Keep an eye on your calendar. Uh, with COVID and everything, uh, we are moving the webinars about. It's supposed to be uh, usually the second week in each month, but we do have to move it about sometimes. So uh, I thought the hurricane was going to affect things as well. But um, fortunately, it looks like it's not hitting Houston. Um, so I was able to take care of it for you today. So um, oh, one more question. The tachometer is located in which section of the UPS again? Each fan has the tachometer on it. OK, so each fan has a tachometer built in and then that tachometer gets connected to um, if it's the inverter, it will get, get connected to the inverter control board and that senses the speed of the fan. Um, if it's in the charger section, it will connect to the charge control board in the DPP. OK. So Brooke will be sending everybody out a survey. If you get a survey, please do fill it in. And, and we always ask for topics for us to do other webinars on. We really want to hear back from you. Um, we want to know what you want us to teach you and to go into in more in depth more um, because we do run out of ideas sometimes. So please let us know in the survey what you want to do um, for the next webinar. Uh, one other question that's just come in is solid state is a reference to the oil and gas industry. No, solid state controls is the name of the company, um, the division. Um, it was a standalone company before it was bought by uh, the Marmon Group back in the 90s, I think. And then Amatech bought it from there. So Amatech is our global corporate brand. And then solid state controls is what the division is called, the industrial UPS division. So um, that's what solid state controls actually references to. So if you see a UPS that has an SCI nameplate, it is exactly the same as a UPS that has an Amatec uh, nameplate, as long as it's the same model, obviously. So the terms are interchangeable. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, if you are in the Beaumont or Lake Charles area, I my prayers are with you. I hope everything um, goes okay and it's not as bad as we are expecting. Um, it's not good. Um, you've had, I think it's two or three hurricanes in the last three years, and I've seen the devastation that it causes. Um, so uh, please do take care and stay safe. And until next time, everybody, thank you so much for watching this webinar. Until next time, take care.